Salem, Starbucks Point South. All you Zoomers, welcome you Zoomers. This is a great thing, this Zooming business. This is the home of the Sail Power Sea Museum, a wonderful Sail Power, incredible Sail Power, just absolutely phenomenal Sail Power Sea Museum of South Rockland, South Rockland's finest maritime museum. Uh, I'm Captain Jim Sharp. 10 years ago, 11 years ago, my wife and I started this museum. My wife, Meg, <laughs> here behind me. What would we do without a good woman behind us? And uh, it's been growing and growing. We've had a wonderful time putting this museum together. And now we're at the point where we're almost bursting at the seams with wonderful memorabilia of the 19th century. Tonight's program, we'll just take a quick look at tonight's program, Keeping the Tradition Alive, Main Windjammer Cruises, the Grace Bailey, of course, and Captain Ray Williamson. It's going to be a long program, so I'm not going to dwell too long on the commercial. But the commercial has to happen. You know how mm -hmm. that goes. So we're going, to, we're going to start out here and tell you a little bit about our new building. Our new building, of course, is being built, uh, as you can see. It's coming together now, and it's really starting, starting to take shape. We're so excited because we've got 4,000 square feet of space in there that we can put our antique boats down at the bottom. Bottom is the rendering of the uh, architect's drawing here. You can see over on the right-hand side, we have a big door there. That's the big entryway. Of course, it's all framed up out there now, but uh, we have yet to put the face on there. And that's where our big steamboat is. Our 40-foot stern paddle wheel steamboat is going to go in there as a display. And a lot of other things, of course. Over in the middle of it, just beyond the main entrance, we're going to have our Friendship Sloops, Muscogee Sloop up in there. Over a little bit further to the left, those doors are for the Harrishoff 12 and a half. We've got a couple of antique built in the 20s, Harrishoffs, and we've got a couple of Beetle Cats built in the 20s as well, and they go in the other doors. And the little door down beyond is a door for our Optimus Prams. You can see in the photograph above our sign for the museum and our schooner, the gym, they're still covered up for the winter time, but we'll be taking the plastic off as the building gets finished up and we'll be uh, using that as part of the display. What a wonderful entrance it's going to be for our new Perkins and Square Foot building. What is an Optimus Pram, you say? My God, what is an Optimus Pram? Well, we have a skiff program that we set out. Sail kids for free. It's one of the greatest things we've done, I think. We take kids from six to nine, six to 14 years old, actually, and we give them a whole week of sail training for free. Little kids, little funny little kids, six and seven and eight years old. You can see them there on the left there with that skinny little arms, skinny little legs, and they don't know anything about a sailboat, of course, and they're rigging their boats out there, getting them ready to go overboard. Of course, as in the right there, you see they're, they're have their own boat there, their own captain. And after the first day, they know how to handle those darn things. And their buddies in the boat next to them. And the idea, of course, is to go faster. There they, there they are out there on the last day doing, doing the race. Everybody in their own boat going as tight as they can go. This is the way it works. Sail Kids for Free, our, our skiff program. Day one, the kids come and they learn what a centerboard is and a rudder. We put them on a tether. We push them out in the water. They realize how the sail works. Day two, we cut the tether off and push them out and let them go. We, of course, have a chase boat. We're telling them what to do and how to do it. And they're having a grand time figuring out how the rudder and the sail works and make, makes the thing propel. Day three, they got the hang of it. Day three, they're out there and they're going around the buoys and they're coming back into the little basin right there where we are. And they're really, really knowing what they're doing. They turn the boats over, they ride them up again. And by day four, they're really out and they're really sailing. By day five, they go around in the grand race, they come back in and here they are after they get back in, after their week's training. Do you wanna go out again on the boats? You bet we do, they all say. And all of this is supported by the Sail Power Steam Museum and the Mid Coast Sailing Center. Mid Coast Sailing Center, this is what we do. Here you can see up in the upper left, these kids are just starting out in their grand race at the end of the week. And right at the, at the start line right there, boy, they are so excited. But we make a promise to you, if you donate to the SCIF program, if you donate a hundred bucks to put a kid, a young kid through a week of sail training, we will double it by putting another kid in another boat and you'll get double for your gift. 
So look at that $100, just a hundred bucks. And you can put two kids out there in the water and have them learn to sail. And they get so excited, they forget about the telephones. 200 bucks, you get four kids, 500 bucks, you get 10 kids. Come on, you can do it, you can afford it. Talk to your neighbor, get together, donate a thousand bucks and we'll put 20 young ones through a whole week of sail training. This, that's our skip program and that's our promise to you. And if you will get these kids out in the water, they soon learn how to be independent and learn how to do things on their own. It's really a great, a great thing. We're so excited about it. Well, you can tell by how I raise my voice, how excited we are. But let's get going now night on our program. Uh, sometimes there's a little lag in the uh, Zoom programming here, and I may be speaking a little ahead of the picture that you're seeing, but I hope it'll work out. Keeping the tradition alive. That's what Ray Williamson is doing, keeping your tradition alive. That's his slogan. I think it's a great slogan. 1882, the schooner Grace Bailey was built. Um, Ed Bailey and a, a Bailey Lumber Company in Patchog, New, uh, New York, built that vessel and built it beautifully, built it to the best and finest materials and built it for cargo. And uh, that is the beginning of the Grace Bailey, beginning of the tradition. Schooner Mercantile, 1916, of course, she was built the same way. She was built as a lumber carrier. Here she is loaded right up to her decks at, on the early days of the Schooner Mercantile. Those are the only two vessels that are still alive. Back in 1882, Camden Harbor looked like this. Back in 1882, of course, Camden Harbor was a mud flat, like all of these little harbors were. Old boats are grounded out there at low tide. They have to wait till the tide comes in before they can float off and go anywhere. Well, of course, uh, Frank Swift with his Windjammer uh, outfit, he came along a little later than that, and they had already dredged the harbor. Frank Swift was an amazing man. He owned more schooners, had more fun with schooners than any man I ever know of. He was born in 1902, he passed away in 1978, and during that period of time, he really set the record in schoonering. He not only set the record, but he uh, fa fa established the moniker of the Windjammer capital of the world in Camden. 12 years from 1936 to 1948, he bought and operated 13 different schooners. In 12 years, he bought more than one schooner a year. God, it's just unbelievable. And Ray Williamson is following right along in his heels. Ray Williamson now has four schooners. He owns more schooners than anybody I've ever seen, anybody around <laughs> Camden anyway. But Frank Swift was an interesting man. He was kind of artistic. And of course, uh, he was born during the Depression, uh, or he grew up during the Depression. He had to do everything he had to do. He had some sail training. He was interested in vessels, but uh, in doing what he had to do, he became a camp counselor at the Camp Wigwam, uh, down in the western part of Maine here. And um, he, for some reason or other, decided he was looking at these schooners in Bucksport loading, and he decided he would try and take some of his camp camp kids out on a schooner cruise. So he made an arrangement with uh, old Parker Hall, who uh, at that time made the arrangements to take these kids out and do a two week trip. It was uh, very, very popular. Year after year, the thing they looked forward to the most is to go out on that old windjammer. And he put a curtain down the middle in between, the girls were on one side, the guys were on the other side. Oh, probably they had a bucket for a head, all very Spartan. But the kids loved it. They thought it was great. And that put the seed in Captain Swift's head. We ought to do this and do it with people. So he talked to Parker Hall about it. And he thought that was a pretty good idea. So darned if he said, suggest to uh, uh, Frank Swift, uh, we ought to get the old schooner Mabel. She, she's a great vessel. She'd be just right. She's small enough. She'd be just right for this. So in 1936, uh, made arrangements, Frank Swift made arrangements to charter the Mabel, little old Mabel. She was a pretty little boat from Deer Island. Try out, he had to try out this idea. So the, May, uh, the old Mabel built in 1881. She was an ancient vessel, but she was still able. Swift contacted Captain William Shepard of Deer Island, Deer Island, knew this man, and he liked the idea, and he agreed to go captain. And his wife agreed to go cook. My God, it couldn't be better. 
So I can't vouch exactly to the penny, but it was pretty close to this, nineteen ninety-five a week preseason and $24 in season. But we do know he lost $210 the first year. It didn't pay off. Everybody came down. They looked at that boat at low tide down, down the bottom of that ladder, and they said, oh, geez, I'm not going on that thing. Some of these teachers from Boston turned around and went home. But there were a few of them that came, and they went out on the Mabel. And the more they went out, the better they liked it. And the next year, he decided, well, he didn't do well the first year, but he's going to try it another year. So he found an old vessel, an old vessel uh, uh, in 1937 called the Lydia Webster. Lydia Webster, she was one of these tired old schooners that had been carrying cargo all their life. You look at this picture of her on the beach, they're trying to caulk her up enough so that they can get her over to where they can work on her and, and get some accommodation put in her. And you can see the planks up forward there. They started off their fasting, started even holding them there on the butt end. And uh, well, it was quite a scene, that thing up on the beach, quite a scene, so much of a scene that a woman named Loretta Krupinski decided she would do a painting of it. Wonderful painting of it, 1941, she put out the painting and it just made the, pop, the, the old vessel more popular. It made more people come on a Windsor cruise. 1937, Captain Ralph Gott was the captain. And uh, he said, <laughs> his comment was, finally, we found a cargo that loaded themselves. Well, you know, loading a vessel, they had to do it all by hand in the old days. And Ralph Gott thought, that, well, this is a great idea. So he was captain. He was from Belfast. He didn't know anything else about the Belfast region up there. He didn't have very good eyesight. He could barely see through his old dusty glasses. And when it came on fog, all he did was anchor and wait it out. But he sailed where he called the Belfast Ocean. His whole world was the Belfast Ocean right up in the top of the bay. Well... The poor old lady, she was a tired old vessel and she didn't last too long. 1944, they decided she was uh, beyond hope. So they scuttled her off of Mark Island. When they scuttled a vessel, they probably put rocks down in her and opened up the seacocks and let her go down. There's a deep hole out there by Mark Island where she probably found her resting place. Here she is entering into Camden Harbor under sails. Look out there, there are no moorings. Isn't that amazing? There's a, uh, the old shack over there belonged to Phil Rains. It was come kind of a meat market back in those days. But they're sailing into the harbor. That's what they would do, sail, sail into the harbor, sail in and out of the harbor, of course, because there were no boats to impede their passage in the, in the harbor. So they would win by up at the wharf. Well, the next year, of course, it was more popular and Swift was making progress. 1938, they had to get another vessel, so they found the Annie Kimball. Tired old boat, 1886, she was built. And she was cast up on the beach on Great Wass Island. Captain Manley Grant, I, it's, uh, Swift knew Captain Manley Grant. I guess they were, they were buddies. And I think Manley was a guy with imagination and he got Frank Swift and all these different difficult situations. He said, come on, come on, Captain Swift, come on. This boat has possibilities. So Swift paid $700 for this old slab. They, uh, they refloated her by caulking her up and busting over for a long time on the beach there until they finally got her to float. And wasn't she some old hog? When a vessel gets hogged, their stern settles down. You can see in the picture here, she's got a reverse shear. Her yaw boat, they got it up on the Davidson, it just barely clears the water. The stern end of the yaw boat must have been dragging, of course it's deeper in the stern end of it, must have been dragging in the water when she's underway. Well, she was a tiled old junk. And they had to take her over, caulk her up until they could float her over to Sandy Point where the shipwrights could go to work and put the accommodation in her so that she could become one of the windjammers and do their work at restoration. Poor old vessel. Frank Swift had to retire her in 1943. 1943, I mean, 38 to 43, what, what is that, five years? Her old bones were left to rot behind the granite wall up at the head of Camden Harbor. Poor old Annie Kimball. There the two of them are, Lydia Webster and Annie Kimball, with her anchors dripping out of their hosepipe, both anchors down. Of course, 
when they sail these boats in and out of the harbor, they always have the anchor ready to drop in case they get into trouble and they have to stop the vessel. Well, they get in and they get tied up and they don't cut the anchor. What the heck? They're going out again in a couple of days. Why bother to neaten things up? They may be hanging there a week. It didn't make any difference anyway. So there they are uh, waiting to go, waiting for their next trip. 1939 came along and business was improving all the time. <clears throat> Why, gee, they found the old Clinton and, and here again, the, uh, Manly Grant got Captain Swift into trouble. He says, we, we, can, we can do something with the Clinton. So they got the vessel on June 15th and my God, in two weeks, two and a half weeks, they outfitted that vessel and they got it ready for passengers, two and a half weeks. Boy, it must have been quick. They, they, these vessels, they were pretty Spartan. They didn't have anything fancy in them, and that's for sure. The accommodation were the barest bone necessity. Well, <clears throat> the Clinton filled out the fleet anyway. She's up in the slipway there, my old slipway, in Camden. I owned the old Swift property there, and uh, they're caulking her and fixing her up, fussing with her. And anyway, on the old Clinton, she, they cost $38 a week and $70 for two weeks. A lot of people went for two weeks eventually. And uh, after a while, why she, she just got so bad, they had to uh, put her on the railway and she died there. Captain Manley Grant, he was a great guy. He smoked his pipe and he told sea stories. Everybody loved him. His son went captain as well, Captain Kip Grant. And here is the fleet here. <clears throat> All uh, in that fleet, of course, uh, was, was what Swift had, ex with the exception of the Maddie. <clears throat> the Maddie in the middle there, she was, she's on her way. She's coming in the next slide. But there's the Clinton out ahead with her Thomas. She had a Thomas dinner and uh, the other boats along the way. So <clears throat> in uh, the schooner, Grace Bailey came onto the scene. And I, I got built in 1882 in Patchogue, New York. <clears throat> Ed Bailey of the Bailey Lumber Mills, he built her of the very finest materials, built her the best way he possibly could, built her for the lumber trade, as well as anything else he could make her do to pay a, make a buck. And uh, she was very strongly built, very strongly built, wonderfully put together even went down to the West Indies and carried fruit and cargo and probably carried a lot of rum back to the United States. In 1906, after 25 years carrying all that cargo, she was ready for a rebuild. And when they rebuilt her this time, they renamed her the Matty, which was the daughter of the captain at that time. Here she is carrying case oil into Portland Harbor. Loaded right down almost decks of wash. They didn't use her easy, they used her hard. They used her very hard. Here she is loaded with, I don't have any idea what, but this is a very early picture. And that old dory hanging along on the stern of her, I'll bet they could almost float that across in front of the brake beam on her deck. She was so loaded down. That's the way they used those vessels back in those days. Captain Swiftwood was infatuated with the Maddie. So he had to charter her in 1939 from Captain Will Shepard, the guy that went him, with him on the Mabel. Will Shepard agrees to go skipper. He thought that was a great idea, of course, and much better than loading cargo. And it was a vacation cruise for him to carry people. She is swiftly so infatuated. She was so big, she carried twice the number of passengers any of the rest. So he, he had to have that boat. He bought her in 1940. And in 1941, the infamous Captain Parker Hall which he knew, of course, back in the days when he was the counselor at the Wigwam campground, Captain Hall came aboard in 1941. He is of questionable repute. Here is the Maddie, of course, getting ready for her trip out, another vessel just coming in. The swift boats are going back and forth, back and forth in Camden Harbor at that time. 1940, the depression was over. Captain Swift was operating five schooners. And came the moniker for Camden. Camden was labeled the Windjammer capital of the world simply because of Frank Swift and his fleet of vessels. So here are the, uh, here are the vessels. I hope uh, Paul Dior, Captain Paul D'Orsay is listening in. Paul D'Orsay, you there? If you're there, Paul, I want you to unmute and give me a hard time. 
I picked this picture up and I put the, uh, what was yep. labeled. Oh, there you are. I put down on this picture, the label that was on the pictures and uh, looking at these vessels, you challenged me on the names of these vessels, if you remember. Uh, I, I didn't realize I was challenging you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, uh, but I, I was uh, I, I was volunteering at the Penobscot Marine Museum and going through the Carol Bar Carol Thayer Berry photographs, um, and so I had to do a lot of studying up on identifying each of Captain Swift's. Right, stories. right. So I, I went, That's I wonderful. Went back to, to what, how I had labeled them when I was able to look at the blow up of the original. That's wonderful. And you know, I put them down here and I just put down here what was on the page. And then you said something on Facebook and I said, my God, I gotta go back and look at these. <laughs> and sure enough, the mercantile is not in that picture. <clears throat> and the reason I know that is because the mercantile has this crazy mercantile on her foremost. And I, I looked around and that, that's the wrong boat. So I bow to you. You're a museum type, all right. You got to get things right. <laughs> so that must that must be, as you say, I, I believe that's the candidge. And uh, it's hard to tell because of that white bulwark she had, the crazy white bulwark she had. But that must be the candidge because she has a mass sale. Although candidge had a pot topmast originally, but uh, I'm sure the Swift long since took that topmast down, got rid of it. But so much for that picture, let's move along here. I mentioned to you Parker Hall, he was quite a controversial scamp. He is known as the lone sailor because he gave his crew such a hard time, nobody would sail with him. And he never had any faith in any of the crew that he ever hired. So anyway, he took over the Matty in 1941. He had a reputation because he got in trouble with one of his, his a couple of his crew. He, pulled his gun out and he took one of, one of his crew and shot him full of holes. So people didn't trust him after that. But uh, look at the leer on that guy's face and you know, you, you work for that man. Captain Hall sailed the Matty for only two years. And in 1943, he heard the Alice Wentworth first say, old Zeb, Zeb Tilden was gonna retire. Oh my God. And, and uh, Captain Hall, he, he looked at that vessel, he fell in love with the picture of it. He decided he was going to purchase that. He went down to Martha's Vineyard. He met Zeb Tilden down there. And he said, I want to buy your boat, Zeb Tilden. Well, all right, uh, well, I got one last delivery to make you. Come with me on the delivery and you'll get to know the vessel. Okay, they, they went on that last delivery. Zeb was sailing the Wentworth. I don't know where he went on that delivery. But when they get all done, Zeb came back. Martha's Vineyard, he didn't have a good word to say. A friend of Zeb's went out and, and found the Alice Wentworth a couple of weeks later, and they saw Parker Hall. He said, he said to him, Parker, he said, uh, uh, how, how'd you make out on the, on the Wentworth? Oh, he said, all right, I guess. He said, but that Zeb, I, he don't know nothing about sailing vessel. So the guy went back to Martha's Vineyard. A couple of days later, he met Zeb. He says, hey, Zeb. He says, Zeb, how'd you make out with Parker on the, on the vessel? Zeb says, by God, he says, that guy don't know nothing about a sailing vessel. And that's the way they went. They didn't kill each other. But then Parker Hall, no more crew for him. He sailed to Wentworth by himself in the coastal trade. Loaded her, sailed her, navigated her, and did it all by himself. Quite a guy. At the same year, 1940, uh, uh, Frank Swift had this bug. He went out and bought another vessel. He bought the Lois M. Candidge, and he liked that vessel. So Swift took over command, and he's, he ran the Candidge for quite a time. She was very unusual. She had this great white solid board standing up above a rail there and very identifiable. Uh, I guess she was a good old boat, though. He had her for quite a number of years. And uh, finally, though, like all the rest of them, she wore out, and she finally became a parking lot in Damariscotta. And uh, you go down there now, of course, there's not a vestige left of her, I don't believe. But I can remember her being there when before they filled in the, the parking lot. 
1940, Candidate came into the fleet. There she has her toughness. Monty Haskell and Captain Stevens, they were two old curmudgeons that uh, Frank Swift uh, uh, got together to sail their boats. And uh, along, along that same time came Hattie Loring. Loring was a coast and schooner. She had an engine in her. She was never used for passengers. Here she is at, at the wharf, which was the old lumber, Camden lumber yard uh, back in those days. And that was the wharf that I bought in the 1960s. And uh, she's laying alongside the, the pilings there uh, in the slipway where I had the Odin hauled up in there and a lot of other different vessels. But uh, she, she had a nest of bed bugs and nobody could stay aboard her overnight. So they never used her for passengers. That was the idea when he first got it, but he decided he would use her just for freight. So he used her just for freight and he freighted with that vessel for some years. One time they had a new captain on board one of the vessels and he didn't like the mattress he had, didn't have much of a mattress. He said, go and get me a mattress off the Loring. And they got a mattress and put it over there. In the middle of the night, he got up, he got that mattress, he hove it overboard. It was so full of bed bugs, he just couldn't stand it anymore. But that's why the Loring was never used as a passenger vessel. But <clears throat> very shortly thereafter, the schooner Indra, she was a yacht with a big, beautiful lead keel on the bottom of it. She was a yacht, and they advertised her separately, a little bit upscale experience. They tried to make her into a more expensive and a different kind of a, a, a cruise, schooner cruise. But anyway, in 1951, late in the season, uh, the Indo met her demise. She was on the inside of the berth of all those schooners, the other schooners outside her, and she was just crushed until... <clears throat> Keel was four ton, 14 ton piece of lead. They cut it up and sold it for scrap. Here's Captain Swift and his wife Betty. Uh, Captain Swift was married three times. This was his third wife. Schooners and, and wives sometimes go that way. I must admit, I was married three times, but I got to keep her this time. Uh, I guess he got to keep her there. He bought that wharf from the Camden Lumber Company in. 1943. He now had so many schooners, he had to have a permanent place to lay them, so he bought the wharf in 1943. I guess when he finally retired from the business, he sold the wharf to Harold Corthell in Camden, and Harold Corthell had the clothing stores there and owned half the town, and when I came in the 1960s, middle 1960s, I bought the wharf from Harold Corthell. That same wharf and eventually ran the adventure and the Roseway and the Stephen Tabor and the Bowden from that wharf. Schooner Enterprise came along in 1943. Schooner Enterprise, she was a buildings boat and uh, she was a good sized schooner. She could carry quite a number of passengers and uh, was quite a popular vessel. But she was a weak old vessel. They converted her, made a windjammer out of her, carried quite a number, as I say, but she, they were always working on her. They were always touching her up her, her bottom. Her bottom was just, she was so weak as a cat. I don't know why, but she, she was used for cargo in the beginning. And actually, they took some more adventures, some passengers and cargo together on their first experiences. Eventually, then they uh, uh, used her just for passengers. She replaced the poor old tired Annie Kimball. I, poor old weak and hog down Annie Kimball. But Captain Swift took the helm of the new vessel and he ran her for some years. She lasted quite a while until 1957. Her demise came. She was just so weak. They were pumping and pumping and pumping. They just could not keep her afloat anymore. So they stripped her. They took the masts out of her, took all the goodness off of her. You can see her bilge pump there in the in the left-hand picture, right next to the rod that goes down to the centerboard, which of course with no mass, there's nothing there, but the centerboard's still in her and there's the rod. But they're taking her now over, after they took all the hardware off her, taking her over to the outer harbor of Camden where they put her on the beach there, hauled her up at high tide, as high as they could haul her and made her fast. Look at that beach. I mean, can you imagine Camden Harbor looking like that? 
look at the pile of stuff. There's a man sitting on a piece of plank over there. You can hardly see him with all the debris. But that's where they put the, put the Enterprise. There's another man in that picture just next to the guy up in the bow of the Enterprise. And he's taking a line over, putting it around one of those old pieces of timber to hold her there while the tide emptied out. And they put her there so that they could set her afire and do away with her. There the tide has gone out and they had set her afire, put the oil to her, and she's starting to burn down there. And whoops, she was in the newspaper. Enterprise ends her days in the bonfire. And uh, you can see this on YouTube and stop it and read that if you'd like. So finally, there's nothing left of the poor old thing. She burned down and burned down until there's nothing but that infamous bilge pump. The bilge pump that was overworked in the poor old vessel was still standing up straight. 1944, he's got to buy another boat. My God's sakes, he found the schooner Lillian to replace the Liddy Webster, which was scuttled off of Mark Island. You remember that deep hole in Mark Island? Uh, the repairs were just too much for her. So Lillian in 1955, she was just the old captain to run her. I mean, she was a sad old thing. She was just plumb worn out and left on a mud bank up the Penobscot River. All of these vessels are disappearing now. They seem to last maybe 10 years, the lucky ones a few more years, uh, unlucky ones a few years less. Mercantile came along, 1945, another Billings vessel, sister to the Enterprise. Captain Swift now had eight windjammers and one cargo vessel all operating and business was booming. Isn't that amazing? The old mercantile, she's quite elderly. In those years, you can she, see she doesn't have much shear left. Matter of fact, she doesn't have any shear left. <laughs> but uh, she, she was a tired old boat by the time I sailed on her in the 1960s. She was a wooden uh, wood carrying vessel uh, designed to built to carry uh, wood, cord wood, and all kinds of firewood. And, uh, uh, that, that's what she was used for. Uh, since the business was so successful, Swift needed another vessel, so he bought the mercantile. He needed a vessel he could put more bunks in. And uh, well, the Billings brothers built her over on Deer Isle. She's an interesting vessel. Here she is in 1916 as a brand new boat. You can see the beautiful shear she was built with. Uh, the Billings brothers built five of these incredible coasters. I guess there were five brothers, they each had to have a vessel. The Enterprise, the Progress, the Mercantile, the Billings Brothers, and the Philosopher. They all had very commercial names, except Philosopher. I don't know where that came from, but it was, they built these vessels with a wind-driven bandsaw, a wind-driven power saw. And there it is, set up on the framework just behind the vessel. Very interesting, very interesting way to build a boat. There she is in the winter time, tied up, uh, laid up with, of course, no sails on her booms or anything like that. And the ice filled in around her. And uh, of course, in the other picture, uh, the, uh, what do I say? I'm talking about the American, I'm talking about the Eva Collison. Eva Collison, 1945, she was bought, built, uh, bought her at the same time. <laughs> Captain Swift certainly had this addiction. He added another uh, vessel to the fleet, fine vessel. And uh, he, he liked her very much. He sailed her for eight years himself. The Cullison was built in Baltimore, 1888, with the Bahama fruit trade and for oystering in the Chesapeake. She's obviously an Erster boat, what they called an Erster boat. And she Erstered, got Ersters both in the Chesapeake and down in the Delaware Bay. Eva, Eva Collison and laying alongside the Enterprise there uh, in Camden Harbor. Uh, I don't know what year that was, but probably somebody could tell me. Uh, Andrew Wyeth decided he would use this vessel as a painting. He saw it laying down in Rockport where she finally died. And you see the big building he wrote, he, he painted in the background. Here she is with uh, hay all around her in, in uh, a little creek up there uh, in her final birth. 
and a big building in the background. Well, Wyeth was here. There's the big building in the background. This is down in, in uh, Rockport, Massachusetts, down on the beach there, where she finally was hauled out and uh, well, she was given to the Sea Scouts and eventually to an amusement park. And finally they got her aground there and she never left. But that was where he was so inspired us to do that painting. Then finally, the very last of it, 1948, 1945, he, a little rush fit in between buying those other boats. And he finally bought Irving Johnson's Yankee. The Yankee, the wooden Yankee that went around the world, I think in one or two round world voyages. This was the most expensive vessel, $10,000 it cost, of course but she was a much finer vessel in, in much better condition. But he had this idea he would experiment in cruising different areas. So he and Walter Boudreaux got together and partnered up and they decided they would run her in Nova Scotia. She eventually sank in the Broad Oar Lakes up there. And uh, my wife and I, in one of our cruises in the old motor, motor vessel Maine, we went up the Broad Oar Lakes up to Bedeck there and I inquired where was the Yankee and they pointed out where she went down and we <clears throat> went out over top of her. We could look down through the crystal clear water up there in uh, the Broad Door Lakes and we drifted right over top of the Yankee. You could see her hatches, we could see her broken bowsprit and her whole hull form. We could look right down over the side of our vessel and uh, she was down there in about 10 feet of water. Anyway, the same year, Captain Swift decided he would partner with Jim Nesbitt and they put the old Mabel down in South Freeport, Maine, carrying passengers down there. The fleet now was shrinking. The, the vessels that remained after the Brigantine Yankee, and she was a beautiful vessel, too deep, he said, too deep for Maine waters. Well, of course, she was a keelboat, but a different kind of a vessel than the old center borders that he was used to. Here's the interest, she's still, still floating there, still alive at that point when he first got the Yankee. That's a nice picture of her laying alongside with a big long yard arm. So back to the, the same old picture that we criticized before in 1957, after Captain Swift was in the, best, in the business 25 years in the windjammer trade. He's had just two of his schooners left, the Maddie, Maddie the very elderly and the mercantile. A lot of age on the both of them, and they needed expense, extensive repair. So in 1960, when he sold the two vessels to his partner, Captain Jim and Dorothy Nisbet, who sailed them for only nine years, nine years with paid captains. Jim Nisbet didn't want to take the vessels, apparently. Captain Fred Moray and Ross Eaton, two ancient mariners with a lifetime of experience. I came on the scene in 1962, 1963, well, right in between there anyway. And I sailed for Fred Moray on the Maddie for a couple of weeks. She always went out early with a full load of people while the mercantile lay waiting for the next horde of passengers to come up from the cities. And uh, I worked for Fred Moray uh, uh, those two weeks and uh, I must confess my impression was that poor Fred really should be put out to pasture. His eyesight was very poor. Uh, he was not a very good captain. He didn't give uh, orders that you could understand. I had to sort of think what he wanted and put the two, uh, what he said together with what he intended. And somehow or other, we got through the two weeks and we did all right together. Then Ross Eaton, I switched to the mercantile and Jim Nes Nesbitt came on the mercantile for the first few days. I didn't like that at all. He taught me how not to do things. And Ross Eaton then took his place. He was breaking Ross Eaton in on the mercantile. Ross Eaton had uh, the largest captain's license in the country. He had pilotage for every major seaport in the United States. He was a marvelous man. He had three double hernias, crystal blue eyes, and a mind as bright and could handle a vessel. 
you could lay that vessel alongside with a ping pong ball in between that he, uh, the vessel and the wharf and it wouldn't break. He was a marvelous man. I worked for him that summer and had nothing but absolute awe for that man, Captain Ross Eden. So anyway, I guess I skipped one there. 1969, then the vessels were sold out to Captain Les and Ann Beck, who sailed them for the next 17 years. With the Maddie now over 100 years and the mercantile approaching 80, there was really an incredible amount of maintenance. Unbelievable that these vessels lasted as long as they did. And in the middle of that, oh my gosh, a disaster in August 1970. The poor old Maddie with Fred Morey again, and as I say, he really, he was mixed up by this time. He went on the rocks near Stonington. I, I, I don't remember whether it was Camp Island ledge there or whether that was a Scott Island ledge. We were right around the corner on the adventure over at the Hell's Half Acre having a lobster bake. I always wanted to have a lobster bake on Hell's Half Acre just because I liked the name of it. Anyway, we woke up in the morning and Fred had gotten underway just at the top of a high tide and he got on that ledge. The tide, uh, tide ebbed out, of course, and the vessel lay there uh, over the ledge. Just, just, she just kind of squatted over that ledge. She was so poor. Anyway, if she, they say if she was a new vessel, she would have cracked all the timbers. But she was so old and soggy, she just well, kind of lay over it like a wet dish rag. And uh, the tide came back up, and uh, of course the, she was opened up, and the tide just filled her up inside. And the mattresses and the pillows came floating out the hatches. Well, the next low tide, they were able to uh, put some plastic around the hull, and they chinked her up. And so, so the second high tide, then they finally got her off. In this picture, I want you to notice her forward chain plates. I, I remembered something about that, but I couldn't quite remember the details. The uh, chain plates come down from the rig and they come down on the side of the hull and they're bolted, bolted into the side of the hull, into the shear streak, maybe the next streak down, maybe one more streak down. That's where they stop. They usually have three bolts through this all shearing strain, so <laughs> you need that bolts. But you look down there at the chain plate on the forward, the, under the foremost there of the matty, and they go all the way down around the bilge and they go down to the keel. And uh, they go down on both sides and I believe they were bolted together. May, Ray, maybe you can tell me that. Were they bolted together down through her keel? I think Jim Nesbitt did that, didn't he? I, I'm not aware of that. It certainly wasn't that way when I got here in 1982. Is that right? Yeah. What? Uh, were her chain plates or chain plates longer for any reason? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I think they were were longer, but they certainly didn't go down to the keel at that point. No, no. maybe maybe that was just the rumor at the time. But uh, of course, she was so limber, and I guess leaking so badly. Uh, that, that was what uh, they tell me Jim did. I, I never saw her on the railway. Anyway, back in those days, it was sailing and bailing. I think this must be a more uh, recent picture. Who is that lady there? Uh, that's my daughter. Uh, that's your daughter. Yeah. I thought so. Good looking woman. Takes after your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Maddie, of course, poor old Maddie was without her centerboard in those days. And uh, sailing a vessel without a centerboard I think would be quite a feat. And uh, I'd like to ask some of the old captains about that, their days sailing the old Matty. Here in, in this picture, of course, uh, first, first of all, in 1971, Captain Mike Anderson took command and sailed her for four years. Isn't that right, uh, isn't that right uh, Mike? You were there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, Jim. Yeah, uh, four years and uh, I was so, so happy. I had been on the, on the mistress uh, for a couple of years before that. And uh, I was uh, very happy to be on board the Maddie. Uh, Ted Schmidt was the mate. And uh, I just had a great time. Uh, and, yeah, she made a bit of leeway, a little bit, I guess. But uh, 
But she's a she's a good sailing boat, isn't she? Oh, it is is a great sailing boat and um, carried a nice yeah. number of passengers. And and back then, what I really liked was that the captain had his own cabin right off the main cabin. I think that's been changed, but um, that was really nice. I, I I enjoyed that a lot. And uh, of course, I I loved working for uh, Les and Bex. They were first rate people. Les was a real hard working guy. Um, and and Anne um, was like a, a rock behind him. And I, I felt that I was really in good hands working for Les and Ann Banks. They came from California, did they? You know, I, I don't think it was California, maybe the middle of the country. Uh, but Les had been a, a passenger on the Merry Day. We'd met him a couple of years before. And, and, oh, um, and uh, you know, they were a young couple when they moved to Camden. Anne was absolutely charming. They had a, a, a baby girl, and then Michael, uh, their, their youngest son, was, was born, I think, shortly after they bought the boat. And, and uh, I felt as if I was working with a family, uh, not working for a family. Really enjoyed it. It, it, it was great. And, and yeah, Matt, Maddie made a little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of leeway, but, uh, you know, I've been on the mistress, so it was nice to be on... The Maddie. I, I absolutely loved my time there. I was for uh, four years on board. Yeah, great, great. All right, thank you, Mike. Hey, Jim, can I make a commercial? I'm I'm putting a hundred dollars into an envelope for your uh, your your sailboats in Rockland Harbor. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Go thank on you to work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You're, very, you're a very wise man because these kids that we're taking out now, they're the kids that are going to be at the helm of these vessels in another 10 or 15 years. Well, it's a good investment then. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. And now, Paul D'Orsay. I, Paul, I know you're out there somewhere. I would like to like to ask you a couple of questions. I'm, I'm here. You're here. Yeah, how did you like sailing a vessel without a centerboard? Well, you know, yeah, your your, your weight kind of goes diagonally off the the weather quarter, but um, she was just a wonderful boat. And and I will mention, thinking about Mike uh, talking about how much fun it was to work for Les and Anne. I think Anne is on this program. Um, yeah. I think I saw her name there, um, so I'm glad to see her. Um, yeah, yeah they, I mean. Wonderful boat. What what I remember especially is the from the wheel box, the the shaft of the of the wheel was off center. It was on the port side, which made it a lot more comfortable to steer from the port side of the, the helm. And <laughs> at some point I realized that there were two holes in the deck, two depressions, where for 80 some years helmsmen had been standing to steer the Maddie. And, you know, and when you realize you literally got your feet in the depressions that guys have put there, you know, long yeah. before you, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Yep. Yep. Great. <laughs> well, Ted, Ted Schmidt told me, Ted Schmidt was made for you. He was indeed. Mike, Mike well. had a whole crew, a, a boat in great shape and a whole crew in great shape. So I had it easy. <laughs> Well, Ted, Ted told me one time you were having a lobster bake down on Russ Island and you had to take a club to drive a ram out of your lobster bake. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that was one of those things that um, I, I was the last one to join the party and, and everybody's kind of yelling and screaming, Captain, Captain, do something. There's a ram eating our fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> and I... Was so it's like okay, you know, the the captain's supposed to be able to do anything, right? And I'm walking up to this beast, going like, "What do you do to get rid of a ram?" And he must have some way of defending himself, but I couldn't think of what it might be. So I grabbed a hunk of wood and slaughtered him in the behind. And he turned around and lowered his head, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's what they do." <laughs> <laughs> uh, great fun running schooner cruises, huh? Yeah. Well, Ted, thank you, Paul. 
Ted Schmidt, um, he's kind of a, an old sea captain and a dinosaur, and, and he doesn't have a computer, he tells me. So I told him, uh, tell, tell me something, just tell me a story or two about Vernon the Matty, and he, he did, he, he recorded something for me. So he did tell me a number of different things that were, were quite interesting. One of them, I remember he took the uh, ashes out when Frank Swift passed away in 1978. Uh, he took Rod Swift out of the Matty, and they went and they spread the ashes in Penobscot Bay from the schooner Maddie. And I thought that was pretty, pretty fabulous. I think I would like that kind of a, a situation when I go over the bar too. Ted Schmidt was with the vessel 22 years, he told me. My gosh, that's really amazing. He came, he came as a, well, I guess he came to look the whole thing over first, and then he came as a passenger, and then he came as a crew and washed dishes, and then he finally became a cook. And then he finally came up on deck and for 22 years he was there. And uh, when he finally got his captain's license, the poor old thing, he, of course she was very elderly at that time, but he sailed her for 11 more years after that. Really a phenomenal record on the old Matty. Ted Schmidt and the Matty were a part of each other, I guess. Uh, sorry that he can't join us in person, but our thoughts are with you, Ted. You'll be seeing this on YouTube, I'm sure. Uh, I wanted to mention that he told me, Ted, Ted Schmidt told me about this incident where they had a terrible gale of wind, a terrible southeaster in Camden Harbor. I had forgotten all about it. Here's the Maddie and the Mercantile. As a matter of fact, you can see the Mercantile's cross tree up there, that great long iron looking weird looking cross tree that she had on her, but makes it very identifiable. Uh, they were putting a pipe, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was a sewer pipe or a water pipe or some kind of a pipe across the upper end of Camden Harbor. And they had to blast the ledge out of there. So they said, all the vessels got to get out of there because if we do blasting, it's going to suck the caulking out of the bottoms of the boat and they'll all sink. So they moved the Matty and the Mercantile up right just below the yacht club there at the old coal dock pretty exposed right there in a southeaster. And I moved the adventure over to Wayfarers on the other side of the harbor. Well, didn't it come on blow one of the worst southeasters they've had in years? And here was the vessels trying to survive their anchors, straining on their anchor chains and uh, banging up against the dock. And there were lots of pieces of the Matty and the Mercantile up on the beach after this storm had gone by. The adventure was over there tugging at the dock uh, in in uh, Wayfarer, and we called a bulldozer to come down. We put a wire around her foremast, and we buried the bulldozer's blade down into the dirt over there and took a strain on that cable in order to keep her from tearing the dock down. It was a wild, wild uh, southeaster. So in 1986, the Coast Guard came along, and they deemed the poor old Maddie unfit for service. They revoked her certificate of inspection. Oh, what a disaster. Poor old thing. They, they took away her certificate of inspection. I don't know exactly what happened in the incidents after that. But we needed somebody to come along and save these vessels. Save these vessels that were part of the tradition of Camden Harbor. And uh, who on earth... <clears throat> will come and save these boats. Well, we were really very fortunate. Ray Williamson came along and Anne, the two of them, young people, full of zeal, full of energy, full of imagination, <clears throat> full of what it takes to get one of these vessels and, and put it to rights. <clears throat> they looked at the boats, he only wanted to buy one of them. And uh, I guess Les said, no, you gotta buy the both of them. So he did, he bought the both of them. The Maddie with her certificate listed, lifted, I should say. And he bought the both of them, Captain Ray and Ann Williamson. And here's the poor old Maddie, built in 1882, 1986, 104 years old, and her certificate lifted. Here's a man, Ray Williamson, with vision. Here's a man with true grit to sit there and take on such a project. I, I take my hat off to you that to rebuild one schooner is enough. 
to rebuild one schooner at a time, like John Foss has done, uh, one after another after another. Well, that's something else, but to take on both of them at the same time and another smaller boat. Well, it was a mindset, not only set in trundles, but it was a mindset. This is the way the guy worked. He put this together and he just was absolutely bound and determined to do it and to do it right. He rebuilt the Matty not to just carry passengers, but to keep the tradition alive, he rebuilt the Matty in the way the Matty was built originally. And I got to hand it to him. He built, rebuilt it just exactly the way it was. Now, Ray, come in here and tell us how you did this. Here we are in, in Rockland. They're dragging the Matty up at Lee Nielsen's shop, I believe. Isn't that right, Ray? Yeah, that's right. Um, what did you have on? What did you have underneath her? What did you? How did you get her up there without rails or anything? Well, <clears throat> we actually uh, did the mercantile first. And what we did is we set up two markers as like a range and we brought her in uh, high tide, full moon, and uh, just put the yaw boat on full ahead and headed straight for, the, for these range markers. And uh, as we approached the beach, we dumped our anchors overboard and just ran her straight up on the beach and we had uh, attempted to get the Nobleboro house movers to bring the boat up, but uh, they were busy and couldn't do it. And a big storm came up. We lashed her down. We took uh, a, a big 600-foot uh, coil line and, and put, uh, put it to those anchors and brought the, the lines right up over the transom and uh, put it onto the windlass and cranked it down. We also had uh, lines to shore and we figured, well, we're gonna rebuild the vessel anyway. Uh, so in order that we were afraid she might you know, shift, we opened up all the seacocks and just let her flood. Uh, I sat down there in my pickup truck throughout the whole storm that night. And then the next morning I said, that's it, uh, went out and uh, you know, bought or borrowed uh, about a dozen 20 ton jacks. And we just started lifting the vessel and blocking her up. And then they were building a, uh, the bridge in Bucksport and, and they had just finished tearing the old bridge apart and they had all these I-beams. So I bought a, a truckload of I-beams and then we put the I-beams down and slid it uh, slid them underneath the vessel and actually after jacking the vessel up uh, in between the tides uh, it took us three days to do that and we moved the vessel two feet straight up uh, and then we slid the I-beams underneath made a cradle and then put a 10-part purchase on it with uh, uh, a 7 eighths cable and huge blocks that we got from uh, um a crane company and and uh, we made a 10 part purchase and had a uh, that uh, caterpillar dozer there hauling on that uh, on that purchase and we would run it down the beach and the schooner would come ahead on rollers that were made out of uh, uh, I don't know inch and a half or two inch pipe we packed the pipe with concrete so that uh, they wouldn't crush. And a lot of them did anyway, but <laughs> the dozer would go down the beach, a hundred feet and the schooner would move ahead 10 feet. And then we'd regroup and regroup. And uh, it took us all day, but we got her out of the water. So in, uh, in uh, this picture here, well, let's see. Uh, when we did the, the uh, the Maddie, we already had the cradle built. So, uh, you know, reverse operation to get her back in the water, the mercantile. And then, and then uh, we had the, the cradle already uh, built. So we were able to bring the Maddie in and uh, put her on the cradle and a similar uh, arrangement to get, to get her out of the water. 
ingenious, ingenious. Honestly, phenomenal. Uh, that, that's amazing. To take her out of the water with absolutely nothing but a beach. Great. They told me you were so busy you didn't take any pictures of her tearing her apart. You just uh, waited until you got fresh wood on there and then took a picture. This is the first picture I have of her. Yeah, I guess did, uh, did, did, you're right. <laughs> how much of her did you save? Uh, I think uh, there were two original planks, maybe you know, five or ten percent of the of the uh, uh, of the framing, and and Kielsen. We rolled the Kielsen out with fourteen by fourteen and about fifty something feet long. Wow. And uh, after we put, you know, reframed her, we rolled the Kielsen back in. But the Kielsen, the keel, uh, ten or fifteen percent of the frames and. Just a couple of the original planks for good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Just about everything. Everything looks new there in that. Yeah. And you you put all the frame back in. Boy, she's got a lot of frame in her, of course. Tremendous ceiling, tremendous knees, tremendous uh, all of that show and everything. My God. For passengers, you don't need half that much strength, but you built her just the way she was built originally. That was important to me, yeah. And, and as you could do, I think that's fabulous. Really fabulous. Tell me about those knees, getting all those knees, those lodging knees, those, those uh, hanging knees, and one after another after another. How many were there in the vessel? Over a hundred. Over a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> and you went all the way up to the northern part of Maine to Rustic. Where was that? Uh, yeah, I was down east. We, we, uh, I had read an article in Wooden Boat Magazine about this old timer that that's all he did his whole life was he would, they called it hunting for knees. So I thought, well, I'll go to this guy and get him to help me. So uh, these were, these were hack, hack attack, hack they... attack, right? So, so I get in in my truck and uh, and we're heading out there, me and a buddy. And uh, I had the article with me, and I told my friend, I said, "Hey, read that article." As we were getting close, <laughs> uh, I said, "Read that article, just so we, you know, a little bit more familiar. You know, we sound like we know a little bit more than we actually do." And uh, he read the whole article, and at the end of the article, it said something like, uh, I'm 82 years old, but as long as I can walk, I'll hunt the hack and tack knee. And that was the end of the article. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, how old is that magazine? And it turned out the magazine was like 14 years old or something. The guy was, you know, 96 years old or something. <laughs> and I'm going to ask him to go out in the woods and chop down these trees. <laughs> and anyway, we finally got there, and uh, and I, I asked to speak to him, and and his, his wife brought me into this like sunroom that he was there, just sitting there, uh, you know, in a chair, and and I told him what was going on, and and uh, you know. I, I came there expecting that he might help me. And, and he said to his wife, call the boy. And, <laughs> and so the boy was his 65 year old son. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes and gets the son and he comes and he says to me, oh, I'm too busy. I haven't done that for years. Uh, you know, I can't do that. He says, you can do it. It's easy. There's nothing to it. I said, I said, I can't do it. I said, I don't even know what a hackman tack tree looks like. So he says, well, I'll show you. So he takes me out into the woods. And he, he, he says, uh, oh, oh, look over here. Here's a hackman tack tree. And he points it out. 
and you know he says but i wouldn't i wouldn't cut that one he says you see those black knots he says you know if it's got black knots like that it's definitely rotten so uh i said i said okay so we walk a little bit further and he said well here's another one right here he says but i wouldn't cut that one he says that's right next to a a, a birch tree he says if they're right next to a butch birch tree they almost always have ants and and i'm saying to myself well this guy must know so much that i you know there's no way i'm gonna be able to do this well <laughs> anyway he's starting to feel a little um inspired by this walk in the woods so he says all right he says i'll tell you what he says you need 100 knees he says i'll get you 50 and you guys get your own 50 so uh, well that's how it all worked out we you know it took us a week to get the first one but then when we once we started catching on uh he told us to to, to hunt in the bogs because the digging was easier yeah. and you would you wouldn't uh, you know, run into too much trouble when you're cutting them out because you have to dig the root out and then cut all the roots and then the tree falls over and and of course the, the knee is the root so you pick out the one that you want right. and leave that one long and uh, we went and we did it and, and he went and, and he got his 50 um, and, uh, and that's how it went. In the end we needed a few more but uh, we went back out and got them. Amazing. Yeah. And you kept the main cabin just the way it was? Uh, yeah, Going pretty. Uh, the, the captain's cabin that uh, Mike spoke of earlier, Captain Mike Anderson there, uh, yeah. uh, that was when I got her the same way and uh, and we put that back exactly how it was but at some point there was uh, a there was a door there and you open the door and there was nothing there but a but a bulkhead and apparently there had been uh, a head in that area and, a, and another another small cabin hmm. and they converted that after uh, cabin to like the salon where you know you would eat um, eat your meals yeah Huh. needed the space and they took out that other cabin but when we put her back uh my wife ann and i shared the uh the captain's cabin it was quite cozy and uh and then the other uh, we we put a head back in there and and the other small cabin that had two berths that my two daughters uh went in and then the rest of the the rest of the cabin we kind of uh, restored it. We took all the pack. Captain Ted, uh, Ted Schmidt, uh, you know, he was the mastermind of, of, of that. He's, uh, you know, um, such a craftsman. And yeah. he took down all the paneling and uh, labeled everything. And we would put that all in storage for whatever, you know, yeah. 10, 11 months before we were ready to put it back in. Yeah. So when we did that, uh, Robin, what's going on here? Who's who's I, who's fooling? I don't know. Somebody's somebody's kids are fooling with our our broadcast here. I've, I'm sorry. Is saying sorry I Let me find see if I can find who that is. Well, I'll keep talking. Okay. Uh, well, we'll. Keep on moving here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, on that main cabin, we had, you know, there, there was, um, of course, crowns of the cabin. There was tumble home and there was rake and all these things had to be figured out when we built the house so that the paneling would fit exactly the way it was. If we had done anything yeah. slightly different, the, you know, it wouldn't all fit, but with Captain Ted's, uh, uh, you know, expertise, we were able to put it all back together. So, so she's right there the way she was back in 1882 with all that hand carved paneling. Yeah. It's pretty special. That's phenomenal. 
And there's your big, big bandsaw. Where'd you get that big bandsaw? Oh, I got that from Les. Uh, Les, yeah. Yeah, Les, Les had uh, all kinds of goodies. Yeah. Of course, uh, he didn't want to part with anything, but when we started the rebuilds, he said, yeah, you got to have it. So uh, that, that looks like one of your Hackman's Hack knees back in the, the background there. Yeah, there was a couple of them there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to ask, can, can I interrupt who's, for a second? Who's that? I have, hmm? Can I just interrupt for a second? Does anybody, this one is beyond me. I don't know how to get rid of all those scribbles. Somebody, I thought, Jim, maybe you had hit some draw thing, but I just got rid of that person that kept showing up every time they came on. Any. Anybody know more about this than I do? Because it would be nice to get rid of those. No, well, that's too bad. But yeah, <clears throat> looks like we got to live with it. <clears throat> I don't know how to get rid of them. I'll keep yeah. looking, but this, this right here is uh, who's, who's that? Boy, right? that that's uh, my good friend Roy Vetterline, uh, oh. who is a shipwright, and uh, he's yeah. the one. He's the one that was with me when we went out to meet those guys, and also. He was the one that went with me to hunt our 50 knees. Nice. It was, it was kind of a special. Everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to do this. And we were having so much yeah. fun. Uh, we said, no, if you want to go, you can come with us. You can come with us on the weekend, but you're not getting paid. You know, this, <laughs> this is, uh, you know, just like a, a volunteer thing if you want to be in on that. And we, we cut them all down, left them on the ground and uh and then went back in back in like uh three or four weeks later when the snow fell with toboggans and yeah. actually i went out and bought a snowmobile an old beater snowmobile and we we loaded them up on a toboggan and and dragged them out of the bog is that right well wow. yeah that's great and that centerboard trunk there boy that is a noble centerboard trunk isn't it yeah, she's quite a quite a big centerboard. It's at least sixteen feet long. Yeah, amazing. And the knees, the knees over and over again. That's that's such great stuff. And frames, my God, look at the frames in her there. There's hardly any space. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That, that scarf in the ceiling there covers five frames. Incredible. She certainly is built. And you just such a nice job. Is that a piano or is that an organ? That's a piano. That's a piano. Yeah. Uh, is that a full size piano or is that a 66 oh, no, no. key piano? That's a, that's a little one that was in uh, Etienne's uh, um, jewelry shop in the window. He used to oh. he used to have mannequins in the window doing oh, beer. Yeah. Is that a is that a Melody Grand? Uh, I really don't know to be honest with you, but. Yeah, I was seeing that in there, and uh, in the window for one of his displays. So I went and asked him about it, and he told me, uh, you know, who owned it, and and uh, I went and asked them if they would sell it. First they said no, but then I got a call six months or a year later, and they said, yeah, we'll sell it to you. So it fit perfectly. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And you had to get a vouch for it, of course. I'm not. Sure, just when that was, and how that went together. And the gallery, one, my God, the gallery is beautiful. <clears throat> and much oh, yeah. like. Uh, uh, she was big in the design of that galley. Uh, yeah. There was uh, some pretty nice features in there. This is Everybody could sit down at once. When, when she was operating uh, right. as the Maddie and. Uh, the salon or the main cabin back aft was where you ate. You could only fit half of the ship's complement yep. at a time. So you had to eat in shifts. It was, it was really a lot of work for the cook, you know, to, right. to do. The crew, two. the crew had to eat up on deck, I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was a seat for Captain Ted. He was the only one that could eat below with the pastors because there were 29 right. pastors and you could sit 15 uh, yeah. at the tables. And so, so he got he got to eat with the passengers. But mm -hmm. another problem with that is when the weather was bad, right. the people down there 
eating, didn't want to leave, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, for the next crew to come in. Sure. So that, that was a prerequisite that, um, that the, uh, the galley would have to accommodate yeah. all of the passengers. There you go. go in that picture, a, a half model that was done by another, uh, good friend of shipwright, George, uh, George Bourne, oh, yeah. who worked with me for several years and uh as a sailor and a shipwright yeah. and uh, uh while we had her out he took the lines off it and made that uh half model and uh gave it to me yeah could i ask Great. a question ray? sure go ahead yeah ray um when i was on the maddie starting in uh 64 65 67 as mate the uh overhead in the main quarters was was paneled in that oak also. And I recall that uh, when Les got it, they did some work, but they took all that paneling out of the overhead in the main cabin. Yeah, so, I, I, I didn't get that. Uh, you know, I didn't know, by the time I got there, that was all gone. Yeah. So I never knew it existed. <laughs> and uh, so I never asked him for it. Uh, I don't know whether he saved it or not, but. Uh, okay. So she doesn't have that feature anymore. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Well, there's the cook, Ray. Where, where, where's the cook in person? Isn't she there? Won't she come and see this? Uh, I'm not sure. She, uh, I, I don't see it. She might have uh, gone to bed. Oh, there she is, though. That's my beautiful wife, Anne. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. She's the only person that worked harder than I did. <laughs> and had time to give you a hug every once in a while keep your courage up huh yeah that's right yeah couldn't have done it without her yeah and there she is by a bone in her teeth and going like mad you can drive her for all she's worth now yeah yeah you know she's, she's not going to come apart on you huh yeah and then you turned around and started on the mercantile or at least second time on the mercantile what was this I the mercantile actually happened before the Grace Bailey. Uh, when we bought it, we bought the vessels, the Maddie, as you said, had the certificate pulled, and we had to do a considerable amount of work uh, rebuilding the starboard quarter and a few other repairs um, before she could go back into service. So we got a two-year certificate for that. And then the next year, the mercantile certificate was up, and they yanked that certificate. So we had to, we had to completely rebuild the bow uh, new stem and four foot, uh, all new framing back to the centerboard trunk. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, you can see a lot of planking, uh, all new bulwarks, rails. Uh, and uh, we actually lifted the deck up and, and propped it up. And the deck was in pretty good shape. So we, we just propped the deck up and rebuilt underneath it and lowered the deck back down. Uh, onto oh. the new clamp. Amazing. Yeah, uh -huh. that's right there. Um, uh, uh, and George, uh, I forget his name now. Uh, George Allen. George Allen, excuse me. Yeah, how could I forget? What a wonderful guy. I mean, he was so much fun to work with. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we really, uh, we really had a great time working with him. But all new night heads, all new framing, yeah. you know, so on. That was that was the first project, and then yeah. the second project was uh, the one that you showed a little bit earlier, the mercantile on the beach. But the first project was done at the north end, and then the second project was done at Lee's boat shop uh, down near the public landing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that was the stern of the mercantile, or actually two thirds of the vessel were done at that point. New centerboard trunk, uh, you know, new new uh, transom and all new framing and planking, pretty much 100% from that point back. Yeah. Then you, still had time to, you still had time to smile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell, yeah, that really is incredible. I don't know what's going on there, but it looks like gyrations. Yeah. 
who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you built the cabins in when the passengers were waiting on the dock to come aboard. Oh yeah, that was uh, that was something. We put we put in the uh, uh, you know as best we could put her back together, um, but uh, we didn't finish, of course. And every week when I'd come in off the trip, I'd go to the office and I'd say, "How many passengers do we have next week?" And she'd say, oh, we have 18. And I said, well, I only have cabins for 16. So I'd go down there and build another cabin or two. And, uh, you know, by the time <laughs> we got into full swing, I had uh, all of them, uh, you know, put together. And there's That's Wayne Martin. Is that Wayne Breda helping you out there? Uh, I'm not sure. Because uh, it looks like him, but he wasn't involved in, in the original no. rebuild. But that well, might have been... Maybe we got, or we got different pictures here. I don't know much about it, but there's a galley, yeah, new galley. It looks like. That's the Mercantile's galley, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And there she is now, my God. And I just put the other superimpose that other picture of when she was new to see show you the the shear she's got a beautiful shear now god i remember when i worked on that boat you know it, it would it, it looked like uh, you know you'd, you'd throw a bucket of water on the quarter deck and it would run right out over the stern uh, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd have to step down from the yaw boat to the rail uh, your boat would be pushing on the on the rail I Mike Anderson will remember this uh, at the uh, uh, talent show in, in uh, uh, Schooner Days. They wrote a song uh, about all the different schooners and uh, the ditty for the mercantile. So to the mercantile, the way <laughs> hey, hi -oh. They're serving pork at every meal a long time ago. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she certainly looks like a different vessel now. Yeah. You keep the tradition, and you really were doing it. Yeah. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. We, uh, this is Rob Whitehurst again. We used to sing on the Maddie about the mercantile that uh, it's the funniest thing we ever seen. She's got a sheer like a lima bean. And uh, <laughs> Captain Nisbet would raise hell with us whenever he heard about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he, uh, this is Jeff Burnett. He, uh, he did indeed race hell with us, but we didn't stop with the lima bean refrain. <laughs> well, you remember the one they had for the Matty? For Captain Fred, the Matty obeys. Way high, but she'll linger for days and days oh, and days. Oh, gosh, it's days. I like this picture. When was that? Those girls were young then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was mid-90s. Mid-90s, yeah. Coming ashore in the old boat. Oh, I would have... oh that one. Yeah. yeah, that was early 90s. Early yeah. 90s, yeah. yeah. And there she is, another bone in her teeth going like mad. Love to see her sail like that. Yeah. So this was the this was the original fleet, the mistress. Funny looking boat. Jim Nesbitt found that mistress when he first brought it into Camden Harbor. Everybody couldn't stop laughing. It was the strangest looking boat without any shear. And uh, I guess it was built in the guy's backyard. Yep. And uh, that was the fleet back in those days. And you turned around and rebuilt that boat and lengthened her out, didn't you? Yeah, well, we had it to the... To the stern, she had no counter. She was, she looked like a motorboat from the from the back, the yeah, tramp right down into the water, you know, and yeah. uh, so we put a, a a horn timber in her, and lengthened her out by eight feet, and uh, gave her a much better run, and she uh, she sails a lot better now. Increased the rig, almost oh, double the yeah. size of the rig. Oh, that made a whale of a difference in that boat. I couldn't believe it. 
I couldn't believe Nesbitt bought it in the first place, but then yeah. uh, you made a vessel out of it. <clears throat> this and is Jeff, Jeff Burnett. Real quickly, uh, Rob and I, when we first saw her, um, uh, we, we, we were uh, concerned about her shape, but nonetheless, we fantasized and we were offered the opportunity to name her, and we did so as the mistress. And uh, so, uh, uh, as C uh, Captain, uh, um, you fulfilled the dream of her becoming ultimately a beautiful vessel uh, to fulfill her name and our vision as teenagers at the time. <laughs> uh, uh, John, John Worth, I'd like to just put, put in one t 10 cents worth is that the schooner mistress is, shouldn't be underrated for what an amazing training schooner it was. Uh, half a dozen of the people that are on here, Mike Anderson, Andy Chase, Paul DiOrse, myself, I think even Hattie ha Hawkins had her for a, a season. Uh, got a lot of their experience. She had more heads than the adventure. And uh, <laughs> you were constantly <laughs> fixing toilets. And uh, I, I, most of the log entries were uh, sailed for fun, powered for distance. Uh, <laughs> she, she would go as fast sideways as she would go ahead. Uh, and um, Ray did an amazing thing to, by, by putting her back together, although I was always disappointed that he didn't put the fishermen and all the other yard goods that were on there because that was the only real fun use to have on the mistress. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Captain, Captain, I always thought I'd do it. I always thought yeah. I'd do it. Never got around to it. Yeah. Well, Captain Rob here was the uh, first skipper of the uh, mistress in 1967. There you go. And... Uh, I had her for a couple of weeks in 68 before I had to leave for active duty with the Navy. So uh, I didn't have the pleasure of uh, uh, playing with all those sails. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Captain yeah. Rob was the first. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I had, uh, I had quite a lot of fun with the mistress. Jim gave me uh, 10 weeks of passengers and then I filled in in the yard early in the spring and mate time on the other big schooners. And uh, I have to say, I, I had one summer and then I went in the army and I was, I think I was in Southeast Asia and I got a letter uh, from Les Bex and he had taken all the ballast out of the schooner. And he asked me how the hell did he get it all back in? And uh, I had spent a couple of weeks just chipping the old rollers from the shipyard in Camden, the cast iron rollers and, and uh, painting them. And they were all sitting at the dock one night, Jim was coming down in the morning to help me load them. And I got <laughs> back about two in the morning. The tide was high, and I just put them all under the floorboards. And uh, he came down in the morning about seven and woke me up to do it. He had noticed the pile of, of uh, ballast was, was gone. And uh, I showed him. Well, that didn't bring her down to her mark. So we, uh, I said, well, let's go up to duck trap with the trailer and get a bunch of rocks and bring them back. We did that. We brought her down to the marks, but then uh, Les got it and I didn't know what to tell him. You know, I was what 12,000 miles away in Vietnam and he wanted to know <laughs> by mail how to put the ballast back in the mistress. Mm -hmm. I guess it got done eventually, but uh, that, that's a story I often think about. Yeah. Well, if you guys wanted from sales to play with, why didn't wait until we got this vessel? I mean, look at this vessel. Yeah, this is great. Now, now, what are you doing? What are you doing with this vessel, Ray? Are you going to use this for your retirement, or are you just going to hold more passengers? Well, we're going to hold more passengers. I'm yeah. not ready to own a yacht. I can only afford to have a boat if it uh, pays for itself. So. <clears throat> uh, we picked up this vessel this this winter, and uh, she was fit out as a yacht and very Spartan. Um, so I had in mind to have her replace the mistress as a six passenger overnight. So this one is fifty six feet on deck. Mistress yep. is now forty six feet on deck. She was thirty eight when I got her, uh, yeah. but. Um, you know, the cabins will be much more spacious. And uh, they'll, again, they'll all have their own heads and sinks in there. Uh, we'll have a shower on board. And, uh, but, you know, lots of deck space. It's, it's all deck on this boat. Yeah, uh, beautiful. Freda is, uh, is uh, 
doing all the carpentry and, uh, you know, helping me with the conversion from a yacht to a, to a passenger schooner. Yep. So she'll be ready this summer. I'm not promising exactly when. Beautiful vessel. She's going to be fun to sail. I'd love to love to have her for a week or two. That'd be great. Well, and, and, I take my hat off to you. Ray, Ray that, that'll, uh, that'll, that'll give uh, the captain some yard goods to play with there. And uh, I sailed on that actress up in Belfast. She's a beautiful boat. I didn't know you owned it. And, uh, awesome. That'll be great to see her out there. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward. We sailed her back from uh, East Booth Bay. Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, she had, she got 10 sales, not, not all of them in this picture, uh, but um, we had all sales flying. It was quite a lot of fun. Yeah. Wow. So here's the whole fleet right there. There you go. Good. Yeah. It's all I could do to one, run one schooner, but here you are with four. My God, it's amazing. So that's not the end. One more, one more picture. That's the end right there. Keeping up the tradition. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, thank you very much. I certainly well, enjoyed I, I've enjoyed putting this together and, and learned a lot about the Swift Fleet. And uh, learn can't, you can't believe every picture you see, but uh, it sure does make it interesting been a lot of fun and uh, I think you're doing a great job. I certainly uh, en <coughs> envy your energy and your youth and all of that. Oh yeah, I'm, just, I'm Buck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, any more questions we have? <clears throat> uh, this is the time to chime in, unmute and have a little kibitz here. Uh, I'd just like to say a, a tribute to Captain Les Bex who passed away last year and what an amazing uh, addition to the windjammer world and tradition he was and working with his family. And I think uh, both Mike and Paul and I agree that uh, working for that, for that family was uh, a great introduction to uh, all of the, the love we have for the, the, the windjammer world. And so fair winds with us. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. A lot of these old fellas are going by, and uh, well, we're lucky we can stay above water. Well, Jim, I, I want to thank you for uh, for putting this on, and uh, <clears throat> it was great to see all the old captains. And uh, yeah, glad thanks. you guys still uh, staying tuned to what's happening in the fleet. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ray. This, this was you to do. Um, we've done all the rest of these. Of course, they're all on uh, YouTube, so you can always go to our website and get the link. You can just flip right over and watch them all on YouTube. And uh, this concludes our, our series right now. We're going to end now because summer's on us. We've got so many things to do with our new building and our sailing programs and everything else. We'll probably finish in the fall with the vessels we haven't done so far, which are the uh, Lindonia, the uh, uh, Heritage, the Isaac Evans, and we may be able to scrape up the Shenandoah. I don't know if Bob Douglas will come on or not, but we'll give it a try. So we'll continue maybe in the fall. Keep your eyes on our website, the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum. And remember, if you run out of sea stories, Here's a great one, my memoirs. If you buy, <laughs> if you buy one, of the, one of the books, we'll give you a free copy. Um, I, I should say, if you, if you donate to our, skip our program, our Sail Kids for Free program, we'll give you a free book, signed book. God, you know, in 150 years, it might be worth $14.95, you can't tell. So anyway, Come to the museum and uh, catch up on everything there this summer. We're going to be open, we're open now and we'll be open all summer long doing our thing with the sailing school and doing our thing with our uh, great, great museum right there. So I'm Captain Jim Sharp. I'm going to sign off for the night and uh, very best to everybody. 
Have a great summer. Do away with Covaris. We get back to normal around here. It's going to be a terrific summer. Right, Ray? That's right. Jim. Hey, you're going, to, you're going to be carrying a lot of passengers this summer, and the best of luck to you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Good night Jim. Good night, Good night, all. Bye, Captain. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, Pierre. Good night, Jim. You take Good care. Good, night, Thank you. Good to see you, Rob. Keep yeah, up the good, good, you. good work. Yep. Yeah, stop by sometime. I will. Good. Good night. <laughs>